Welcome to the lecture on mathematical finance. After we have discussed in the last lecture the notions of absolutely continuous measures, equivalent measures and densities and we got to know the famous theorem of Radon and Nicodem, I would like to focus now on an abstract quantity called conditional expectation. And this will be useful to describe um, in random variable if we have some kind of information about it. But let us have a closer look at that. So let's start uh, rather simple. So again by omega fp I would like to denote my favorite probability space and I would like to consider a real valued random variable x defined on omega fp, meaning that random variable is uh, measurable with respect to um, f and the Borel sigma algebra. And so what all the conditional expectations are about is the following. So let's change slightly the, our perspective. So I would like to assume that the random variable x is integrable. For sure we can compute its expectation. And we know this expectation is some real value, some number. So, but I would like to view that now as a map uh, y from omega to that value. So this means a y is a constant function. It has this constant value um, uh, which is given by this expectation of x, right? And now I can ask, what about measurability of that random variable we defined here? Well, it is measurable with respect to the trivial sigma algebra, namely the sigma algebra which only consists of the empty set on the full space. Well, so how should one think about that? Well, imagine you would like to predict x, but you have no information at all at hand so what you can do is at least you can compute maybe its expectation value so that's kind of one prediction on the other hand if you have all information at hand meaning someone gives to you a precise omega then you know the value of x namely it's x of omega and the idea is now can we come up with a notion such that we can include some more information maybe we do not have to know all the information meaning that we have to know exactly the value of omega but maybe we average out certain events can we come up with such kind of notion a second thing i would like to note here in general this map omega uh, which is mapped to x of omega by assumption it's f measurable but in general it's not measurable with respect to any kind of sub sigma algebra well except from one uh, um, exception of course the natural filtration is contained in f and with that, with respect to that one, x is measurable, but that's the smallest sigma algebra. And if you take any kind of sub-sigma algebra, um, x loses its property to be measurable. So another trivial observation I would like to make here is the following. Let us come back to that random variable. For sure it has the following property, namely that if I compute the expectation of y uh, times the indicator function of this uh, event a where a is, cho is chosen from the sub sigma algebra which is this trivial one then this thing is equal to the expectation of x times the indicator function of a why is that true well it's rather trivial in that example you see um, the only two event events which are in that sigma algebra g is the empty set or the full set so if you plug in for a the empty set we get zero equal to zero and uh, on the other hand if we plug in for a the full set omega 
Then we get on that side the expectation of y, but y is a constant map uh, with value expectation of x. So we get on that side the expectation of x. And if you plug in here the omega, we get also on that side the expectation of x. So you will see that kind of property uh, later on. So in the question I would like to address the following. Is it possible to introduce for general sub sigma algebra g of f a g measurable random variable y which allows us to improve somehow the prediction of x given the information stored in g. Meaning that we would like to have the property that the expectation of y times the indicator function of a is equal to the expectation of x times the indicator function of a for any a from that sigma algebra g. You see, our trivial choice does the job, but is it also possible to come up with more complicated uh, uh, sub sigma algebras of f which have more information stored in it? And you see how you should interpret that. If g is equal to f, then you store all the information. And then it's clear that um, y should be equal to x. We almost should. OK, how we would like to address this problem? Well, let me start uh, to remind you uh, about the elementary um, uh, conditional expectation. Well. That's the following. So you give yourself uh, a random variable which is integral and you give yourself an event called b and you assume that the probability of that event b is uh, positive. Uh, well, what, does, what kind of consequences does it have? First of all, this random variable x is also integral with respect to the conditional measure. And moreover, we can define the condition expectation of x given b in the following way. So the expectation of x given b is nothing else but the expectation of x times the indicator function of b divided by the probability of um, this event b. And you see, in order such that in order that such a um, definition makes sense, it was crucial here to assume that the probability of the event B is strictly positive. And somehow we would like to relax that kind of notion in the following way. Well, we would like to first of all replace the conditioning on a single event by a conditioning on um, sigma algebra. What kind of effect should it have? Well, that thing over here is just a number. But we would like to get back later on uh, um, a random variable, where we integrate out certain information. So here is um, a second example, which is maybe more alluding to what I have in mind. So suppose for a moment um, that there exists a, a most countable infinite uh, index set i and you give yourself um, measurable sets bi which should be mutually disjoint subsets of omega and they should be chosen in such a way that the union of these sets equals uh, is equal to the set omega. And then I would like to define the sigma algebra G as simply as uh, the sigma algebra which is generated by the sets bi. Meaning you take the, um, as usual, the, the intersection and uh, the finite intersection and uh, countable infinite union of these uh, sets in that generator. Moreover, I would like to give myself an integrable random variable x. And now I define the following random variable called y. And that's the map from omega to r and it's defined in the following way. y of omega is nothing else but, I, uh, but the sum over all i from my index sets 
where i should be chosen in such a way that the probability of the set bi is strictly positive. And then I have this value that's just a number, namely this conditional expectation of x given a measurable set bi, with, which has a property that this a probability of that event by our choice here is positive. So we have seen how to define that object. And then we multiply that thing by the indicator function um, that omega is in that uh, set bi. And you see for sure that thing is a kind of random variable. And now we, so to say, integrate out certain information. Namely, if you give me an omega, I can decide in which bi it, uh, to which bi it belongs to. And then I can give back the corresponding conditional expectation of x given a measurable uh, set bi. So in that map y is called elementary conditional expectation of x given g. And it's sometimes denoted by that. A mind that even if you see here an expectation, that object is a random variable, namely that random variable y. It's just a symbol. And here's a tiny exercise for you, namely to check that um, this conditional expectation, this elementary conditional expectation is integrable. It's a G measurable function and it has a property which we uh, wanted to have, namely if we consider the expectation of any uh, measurable set A from the sigma algebra E. And I consider now the expectation of indicator function of A times X. This should be equal to the expectation of the indicator of function of A multiplied by this elementary conditional expectation. So in particular, you see if we have a random variable z, which maps omega to this uh, sequence of um, or takes values in that in that countable uh, space z1, z2, and so forth and so forth, which is a subset of L R. And I set uh, B i simply as the set of all omegas such that z of omega is equal to z i for any i and n. Uh, and I consider for the sub sigma algebra g simply the sigma algebra which is generated by z. Then you see the, this uh, conditional expectation you can rewrite in the following way, namely the conditional expectation of x given the sigma algebra g evaluated at omega is nothing else but um, the expect a conditional expectation of x given the sigma algebra generated by z evaluated in omega. And you see that thing is equal to that um, uh, conditional expectation of x given that uh, event that the random variable z takes the value zi if and only if um, the realization z of omega is equal to zi and the probability of that set bi which is nothing else but the set of all omegas such, such that z of omega is equal to uh, zi is positive. So you really see that we have picked somehow, so we, if we have that object that we con can condition here on um, a realization. And we would like to generalize that. So that's, that's well defined in case this random variable z takes values in a discrete space. But it's natural to say, well, I would like to have that kind of property also, let's say, for a Gaussian random variable. And you see, for a Gaussian random variable, we have a problem here. Because if we consider um, the uh, probability of the event that the Gaussian random variable takes a particular real value, that has probability zero. And uh, so 
you see, we can't define that object by now. So we have to find a way how to um, work around these difficulties. And that's a, that's a question I would like to focus on now. So uh, here comes the formal definition of conditional expectations. For that, I consider an um, integra uh, in random variable x, which is integrable. I consider a sub sigma algebra g of f. And uh, then I call a random variable y a version of the condition expectation of f given the sigma algebra g. And this I denote by this, this symbol expectation of f given g. And this is defined as this random variable y. If the following two properties holds, first of all, this random variable y should be g measurable. And moreover, it should hold true that um, for any measurable g measurable event a, um, the expectation of the product of the indicator function of a times z should be equal to the expectation of the indicator function of a times y. So here are a couple of remarks. Uh, so first of all, the first remark is this random variable y, if it exists, uh, it's indeed integrable. Oh, that's not obvious from here, but you can convince yourself rather easily. Uh, namely, consider the following set A, uh, which is defined as a set of all omegas such that y of omega is uh, positive. And since y is g measurable, uh, that is an event from the sigma algebra g. And now let us have a look at the expectation of the modulus of y. Well, I can now um, um, add here or multiply here by the following sum, namely by I write the 1 as the indicator function of a plus the indicator function of a complement. Of course, these two things sum up to 1, and this is the one which we have here. Now we have a look uh, at, at what happens with the modulus of y on the event A. Well, we know that y is strictly uh, positive, meaning we can uh, get rid of this um, uh, modulus sign, so we just have y. On the other hand, on A complement, we know that um, y is non uh, positive and uh, so we have to uh, if you want to write out this um, absolute value of y we have to plug in here a minus sign well but now we can use uh, the property two because we said well that y should satisfy these two conditions so we apply that uh, either to this uh, uh, indicator function of the set A or to the indicator function of the set A complement. And you see here, I can rewrite that first expectation as the expectation of x times the indicator function of A. I take that minus sign out, then I, I apply that property over here now to A complement and I get here by taking the minus sign again into the expectation, the expectation of minus x uh, times the indicator function of a complement. And now I do the following. I can get an upper bound on these two terms by replacing x by the modulus of x. So in doing so, we have here the modulus of x, we have here the modulus of x, and you see now I can uh, use the linearity of the expectation and write this as one expectation, and then the indicator function of a and the indicator function of a complement sum up to one, and so I get as an upper bound the expectation of the absolute value of x, and by assumption um, that x is in L1, we know that that object is finite. 
Uh, the second um, um, remark I would like to add here, the formulation of the definition is not the most uh, general one. You can slightly extend that in the following way, namely you can get rid of the condition that x is in L1, meaning that x is integrable, meaning that the positive part um, uh, so the expectation of the positive part of x is finite and the uh, expectation of the negative part of x is finite. And you see you, it suffices to, to assume that only one of these two parts, namely the, either the positive part or uh, the negative part, is finite. And then you can define uh, um, conditional expectation in that way. Last remark is concerning why I have written here a version of this means, and you see it in the in the theorem which follows, this random variable y is um, uniquely defined only up to uh, p uh, null sets. So, and that's why if you give me uh, an instance uh, of uh, such a random variable y prime, it may differ from y on a set of measure of p measure zero. So that's why that's not only one condition expectation, but we have a kind of version of it. So, and the obvious question is, <laughs> does the condition expectation exist? And if so, is it unique in some sense. And that's a statement of this following theorem. So I assume that x is in is integrable and then the following uh, two properties holds. First of all, the conditional expectation exists. And second, any two versions of the conditional expectation coincide appear almost surely. So and let us have now a look at the proof and you will see the theorem of Radom Nicodem. Uh, um, will pop up. Well, let's start with showing that the conditional expectation exists. Well, what does it mean? They exist, we have to show that there exists a random variable y from omega to r, which is g measurable, such that uh, the following relation between this um, expectation of uh, indicator function a times y and indicator function a times x holds true for any measurable set a from subsigma algebra g. How we should proceed in that proof? Well, first of all, since uh, we decompose x into its positive and its negative part, and the positive part is simply defined as a maximum between uh, x and 0, and the negative part is defined as a maximum between minus x and 0, meaning that both x plus and x minus are non-negative. And we know that uh, we can write x as the difference between x plus and x minus. And since we assume that x is integrable, it immediately implies that um, x plus and x minus is uh, an integrable random variable. Why is that true? Well, you can write the modulus of x simply as a sum of x plus plus x minus. Knowing that the modulus of x is finite means, and these are non-negative uh, random variables, if you add them, uh, you can throw away one of them and then you get either that expectation of x plus is finite and by the same argument that the expectation of x minus is finite. So that's why they are in I1. So now let me define two finite measures on this, pro on this measurable space omega g. Namely I define q plus of an event a simply as the expectation of the indicator function of a of this random variable x plus and likewise for as uh, I define q minus with respect to x minus. And this definition should hold true for all 
um, measurable sets A taken from the sigma algebra G. What do we know? Uh, well, clearly Q plus is absolutely continuous with respect to P and Q minus is absolutely continuous with respect to P by the same reasoning we have seen in the last lecture. Uh, so we can apply now the theorem of radon nicotine. And the theorem of radon nicotine tells us that there exists a um, G measurable function um, y plus and the G measurable function y minus, which are non negative, which have finite expectations, and which have the property that I can write the measure Q plus of an event A as the expectation of the indicator function of A uh, times y plus, and likewise for Q minus. So you see, you wonder uh, why have we used why, uh, the theorem of random nicotium because it looks similar to that expression over here. But mind, the random variable x is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra f. But here we get an, uh, an g measurable function. That's why. That's the reason why we have to apply the um, theorem of random nicotium. And you see with the remark from the last lecture, you see y plus and x plus need not to be the same. They could differ. Well, once we have defined uh, or constructed these two objects, y plus and y minus, we simply set the random variable y we are interested in as the difference between y plus and y minus. That's our candidate we wanted to uh, get. And well, since uh, the difference of measurable functions uh, uh, is me g measurable, we know y is a g measurable function. So now what we have to check is that this uh, relation holds true. So for that, uh, let us let me fix uh, an event A taken from the sigma algebra G. And let me compute the expectation of the indicator function of A multiplied by this random variable X. So in the first step, I would like to decompose X as we done, have done here and in terms of its positive part and its negative part. So then I can use linearity. So then I can rewrite that thing as a difference of two expectations. And now I'll have a look at that line over here. This we have seen. So the expectation of indicator function a of a multiplied by x plus is nothing else but q plus of a. And on the other hand, the expectation of the indicator function of a times x minus is q minus of a. So that's what we get here. But now we see, well, for q plus and q minus, we also have a representation in terms of y plus and y minus. So let us plug that in here and simply let us use the linearity of the expectation. And so we end up at that stage with the expectation of the indicator function of a uh, multiplied by the difference between y plus and y minus, but by definition this is equal to y. Hence we have convinced ourselves that this property holds true and in that way we have shown that indeed the conditional expectation of x given g exists. Well, let me now uh, convince you that um, this conditional expectation is p almost surely uniquely um, determined by, um, by the random variable x and the sigma algebra g. Uh, for that, let me take uh, two random variables, uh, y and y prime, which satisfies the properties one and two. Let me remind you, so 
I assume that y and y prime is g measurable and for y and y prime this equality holds true for any measurable set A taken from the sigma algebra g. So what I want to show is that the probability of the event that y is equal to y prime is equal to 1. How to do that? Well, let me consider the event A that uh, is given as the set of all omegas such that y of omega is strictly larger than y prime of omega. And let us use that event uh, in that second property, which you can read off here. So, and this I do for both y and y prime. So, I consider the expectation of the indicator function of a multiplied by the difference between y and y prime. Now I can use the property 2 and the linearity of the expectation to rewrite that expectation as, as the difference between the expectation of the indicator function of a uh, multiplied by x and the, the expectation of the indicator function of uh, the event a multiplied by x. You see, you get here a 0. So, moreover, we know on that event A, this difference is positive. So this means that thing over here is a non-negative random variable. And we know by that uh, consideration we have done here, that the expectation of this non-negative random, random variable is equal to zero, which implies that this random variable is p almost surely zero and on that event I can also divide by that uh, difference over here because it's strictly positive p almost surely and hence I get as a statement that the indicator function of a is equal to zero p almost surely which is nothing else but the statement that y is less than or equal to y prime p almost surely. Now I can repeat that computation by interchanging the role of y and y prime and I also get that y prime is less than or equal to y p almost surely and from that I can conclude that the probability of the event that y is equal to y prime is equal to 1. And in that way we have proven that any two versions of the condition and expectation coincide p almost surely. So here's a remark. Uh, so if x is uh, an integral with random variable and g is a subsigma algebra f and if x is g measurable, so a priori f is uh, x is f measurable, but right? if we assume in addition that x is already g measurable, then we see that the conditional expectation of x given g is equal to x p almost surely. Well, what does it mean? So this means somehow if the random variable x depends only on the information stored in that sigma algebra g, uh, well, then the condition expectation, so if we condition on, on that sigma algebra, uh, then, we, then, it's the then we have all information at hand, so that's the same as evaluating the random variable. And uh, we have seen that in the particular case that g is equal to the trivial sigma algebra containing, uh, consisting only of the empty set in the full space. Because in that particular situation we have seen that um, the condition expectation is equal to the expectation which was our our um, prediction of x if we have no information at all okay so let me come now to the definition of a conditional expectation of x given a random variable y what should we mean by that? Well, so for that purpose, uh, let me consider in uh, random variable x, which is integrable. And I consider a random variable y, which takes values in a measurable space, 
which I denote by E and the sigma algebra is denoted by calligraphic E. And then the conditional expectation of uh, x uh, given the random variable y is nothing else but um, the ex conditional expectation of x given the sigma algebra generated by y. Well, here's a question. Is there also a way to, to define uh, the conditional expectation of x given that y assumes a particular value? We have seen um, an example before in the particular case that this random variable y takes only uh, discrete values. And the goal was also to generalize that one to random variables which have a continuous distribution, for instance. And in order to do so, I need the following lemma, which is called factorization lemma. And it's, a, it's an interesting lemma in the following respect. It allows us to characterize um, a random variable which is measurable to a particular sigma algebra. So let me have a closer look at that. So consider a random variable y, uh, which takes values in that measurable space uh, E equipped with this sigma algebra calligraphic E. And uh, uh, so then there exist for every um, sigma of y measurable random variable z. So I give myself another random variable z which maps omega to r and which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra sigma of y and there exists a py uh, almost truly uniquely determined measurable function phi from uh, e to r such that i can rewrite this random variable z simply as a function of as this random variable y. So you see, if you have a random variable z, which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra generated by y, you can express z in terms of y. This is what is, uh, what is stated over here. And this will be the, the solution uh, to the question I asked above. But this you will see in a moment. Let us first have a look at the proof of that lemma. So we have to prove two things. First of all, the existence of phi, and then we have to prove that it's uh, p almost truly uniquely determined. So let us start with the existence. Uh, so I consider a random variable z from uh, omega to r, which is assumed to be sigma of y measurable. So and now I would like to construct this map phi from e to r which should be measurable such that I can write z as phi composed with y and this equality should hold a py almost surely. So in order to do so um, let's start first uh, with assuming that z is non-negative and that z is a simple function, meaning that I can write z as a finite linear combination of um, uh, non-negative coefficients alpha i and indicator functions of measurable sets a i, where a i is chosen from the sigma algebra sigma of y, and as I said, these alpha i's should be non-negative. So what does it mean that, uh, or how can we describe that sigma algebra that is generated by y? Well, this is simply the set of all pre-images of, uh, um, under this map y, of measurable sets B taken from the sigma algebra E. Remember, Y was a mapping from omega F 
to E equipped with the sigma algebra calligraphic E. So what does it mean? That we know that this sigma algebra sigma of y is given in that form. Well, this simply means that we find uh, sets b1 to bn in E in such a way that the pre-image of uh, bi under this map y equals to the set ai which i have used here in the construction of or in the characterization of this random variable z well and once i have found these bi's i would like to use them to define the function phi namely i define it also as a simple function namely the sum i from 1 to n of alpha i indicator function of bi. Obviously, phi is uh, measurable. Well, because uh, it only depends on here on this measurable sets. And the indicator function of a measurable set is measurable and uh, the linear combination of measurable functions, again, is a measurable function. What we have to convince ourselves is that if we consider the composition of phi with the random variable y, we should get back the random variable z. Why is that true? Well, let's plug in the definition of phi. So that's nothing else but the sum i from 1 to n of alpha i times the indicator function of bi uh, composed with the random variable y. So if you give, so that thing should be a function on omega. So if you give my, uh, give me an omega, this simply means that function over here means that I have to check whether y of omega is contained in the set bi. But now I can rewrite that uh, uh, composition between the indicator function and the random variable y also in the following form, namely I can write it as the indicator function of the pre-image of um, the set bi y. Well, I have said you have to check given an omega that y of omega is an element of um, bi and that's the same as asking that omega is in the pre-image of the set bi under this map y. But you see now that thing, that set over here is nothing else but the set AI. And then we get from the definition of that uh, exactly what we wanted to show. So we have convinced ourselves that we can construct this function phi in case the um, random variable z is a um, non negative simple function. So the next step is to extend that result to any kind of non-negative um, uh, sigma y measurable function. And how to do that? Well, with the usual approximation. I know that for any non-negative random variable z, I find a sequence of non-negative simple functions which converge in a monotone way against z. So, and I would like to denote by phi n the corresponding functions which we have constructed in step one. And these functions are all uh, sigma br measurable. Well, since the uh, pointwise limit of measurable function is measurable, we see that the function phi defined as the limit as n tends to infinity of these functions phi of n is indeed a measurable function. Um, moreover, so now we have our candidate. What we have to check is that again, this composition between phi and the random variable y gives us back the random variable z. But this is also true because I can write this phi uh, in the first step as the limit as n tends to infinity of phi n composed with y. From that object, 
we have already seen that I can rewrite that as this um, simple function Zn. And now we see Zn converges um, uh, to that random variable Z, and this is exactly what we wanted to show. So in the last step is, uh, step is in order to get rid of this assumption that Z is non-negative, you simply decompose in general Z into its positive and its negative part, and you apply the step two. So in that way, we have established the existence of phi. Now we have to come to uh, the uniqueness uh, py almost should. Uh, so suppose that we find two maps phi1 and phi2, which are uh, measurable and which have the property that if I compose phi1 with y, I get z, and if I compose phi2 with y, I get also z. So that's that property. So let me define this function psi simply as the difference between these functions um, phi1 and phi2. For sure, this function psi is also measurable because it's um, composition of uh, measurable maps. And moreover, we have the following. If we consider now the absolute value of this function psi composed with y, well, by definition, that's nothing else but the absolute value of uh, psi composed with y. Now we can plug in the definition of psi, which is simply the difference over here. So I get the absolute value of phi1 composed with y and phi2 composed with y. By assumption, we know that z quantity is equal to z and that z quantity is equal to z. So you see these things cancel out and I get a zero here. So how we use that? Well, let me now um, consider the integral of um, psi with respect to that um, distribution of y. So that measure, uh, this image measure uh, um, of y with respect to p. So first of all, I would like to write down what y, uh, p of y is. So that's that quantity. Now remember how you integrate with respect to an image measure. Well, so that's the same here as uh, integrating over omega the random variable um, uh, modulus of psi composed with this random variable y. But we have convinced ourselves in that computation above that that quantity over here is uh, zero, hence that integral is zero. So we have shown that that integral here is zero meaning that that function in here is py almost surely zero because it's non-negative. And from that we can conclude that phi1 has to be equal to phi2 py almost surely. Well, and before coming to an end, here is now the final answer how we should define um, the conditional expectation of x given that a random variable y assumes a value little y. Well, how it is defined? Well, uh, you consider, you start with an integrable random variable x, you consider a map y from omega to e, which is measurable, and then you define the conditional expectation of f given that y assumes this value little y, simply as that function phi of y, which you have uh, uh, constructed in the factorization lemma. Namely, that phi of y is the py almost truly uniquely determined map um, such that the conditional expectation of um, x given y, meaning given the sigma algebra generated by y, is equal to the composition of phi with y. You see, that is the role of the random variable um, z, and we know that the conditional expectation of 
x given a sigma algebra, so in that particular case the sigma algebra generated by y, is a sigma y measurable function. And in that, that way we have uh, constructed the, con uh, the conditional expectation we were after.